in advanced chassis systems, so I worked on one of the very first active suspension systems in the industry. Um, I worked on four-wheel steering. I worked on developing a whole new cockpit design um, that integrated electronics and, um, and hard parts into single, single integrated systems. So I, I was working on advanced things, and I really love the future. Um, that's held true for my whole career. As I moved from, some, from parts and systems and subsystems, um, I moved up to the total vehicle level. Probably my, um, I don't know if it's a claim to fame. Uh, the thing that, that you will remember, how many people watched Breaking Bad when it was on? The car? The, the Aztec? That's my fault. Um, I was the person who sold the Aztec to the, the GM strategy board, and I'll just tell you that's not what I said. Um, but my group did the work to define the concept, to define the need in the market for something that didn't exist at the time, that was a combination of other things. Um, the fact that it, design got involved and it, it, never mind. But, so I was behind the Aztec. Um, then I went to OnStar and I worked as part of a tech startup organization um, within General Motors where you know, it was the first time we combined GPS positioning, a call center with cellular communications into the vehicle and data coming up out of the vehicle to save lives. So again, humans were, were kind of part of that equation of what made that a cool system. Um, I moved from OnStar into a strategic planning role where I was doing the strategic planning for um, growth market opportunities. So looking at groups of people globally with whom our products were not doing as well as we thought they should and trying to understand how we might improve, what might we change in the product to make it more attractive to the customer, uh, better use in their life, higher value. So again, people kept playing a role as I was working still in the future, but with people. Um, and then in the, probably one of the strangest career moves of all time, I moved from strategic planning into research and development. And my current role at R&D is um, I'm the uh, Associate Director of the Human Systems Experience Team. Wow, that sounds really cool, Janet. What does it mean? Um, I have kind of two groups of people that report to me. I have a group of HMI, Human Machine Interface Scientists. So people who design the controls, the displays, how do you input information, how do you, how do you utilize it, whether it's a nav system or a heads-up display or a traditional instrument panel or you know, moving beyond that into some virtual systems. Um, we have a simulator, a 360 degree simulator that you put a real vehicle in and you, you drive things that don't exist yet um, so that we can learn how well it works. And then the other part of my team does foresight. Foresight is not predicting the future. Foresight is looking at trends. Societal and technical trends are the two big areas we focus on. From the trend, a trend is an indicator of change. What's changing the world around, in the world around us? and how might we be prepared for the future that, that, that comes as a, an extrapolation of those changes. So we look at what's happening, um, for example, urbanization. People globally are moving into cities in greater numbers. We're, we're developing mega cities like um, Shanghai today is a meg mega city or, or um, Sao Paulo, Brazil. What's mobility look like in those places? Is it the same as it is here in Lafayette? No, there are no cornfields. Um, pickup trucks don't make a lot of sense there. But do people and goods still have to get from point A to point B? We didn't know, and so we studied it, and we determined that there were some really unique needs in a megacity that we as a, a company, as a, a car company, weren't really addressing. That leads to new work. It led to the establishment of a whole new area of our business called Urban Active Solutions. Um, so we're, we're studying forces of change, and what do those forces mean to people? And where is new technology going to d allow us to better serve those people in the future? Um, I can't believe I get paid to do this, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a cool group of people. We have engineers. I've got people who are mechanical engineers. I've got people who are electrical engineers. I have um, people who have a design undergrad, so they went to art school. Um, we don't right now have any anthropologists, but we're actively looking for some. Um, we work very closely with our global product research uh, associates, the people who went to school and learned how to do market research and design research, so that um, we're asking questions in an appropriate way. One of the, the things that engineers tend to do when they're studying, they have a new idea that they think is gonna solve somebody's problem. They'll say, 
You like this, don't you? It's really cool, and let me tell you why. Instead of listening to the person respond um, as a potential future customer, allowing them to respond and listening to what they're saying and integrating that. Um, so customers are an integral part of what I do every day. It's why I got involved with, Ever, uh, with Epix a few years ago, because as part of the, the GM core team here at Purdue, my, my, my other job, my not day job, is to um, work with different student organizations, different faculty members, and um, make sure that I know where the best and the brightest people are coming from so that we have a chance to, to hire you guys, or maybe you'll just buy a GM car. That'd be cool, too. So, um, like I said, I'd like to talk through a little bit about this. Um, I want it to be very interactive. Ask questions, stop me um, at any point and interrupt because my, the group of people that I work with um, never let me get a full sentence out, so this has been really fun so far. Um, it doesn't happen every day. So any questions right now about me and, and kind of my job or my crazy career path? Yeah. Um, so we, uh, you, you might remember, gosh, back in, I'm going to get the year wrong. I think it was 2006, it might have been 2008, there was a, um, a DARPA challenge for self-driving vehicles. We partnered with Carnegie Mellon University, and we actually won that competition. So we've been working internally as well as with external partners for a long time. Actually, we did our very first self-driving car back in the 60s. And we've got pictures of it. So like you can imagine the sensors and the actuators were a little bit different back then. <laughs> it like took up the whole car and there was no room for a driver. So um, it's just that with the advent, you know, technology breakthroughs, it's a lot more feasible today. So do you really, because that's something I think about, do you really think self-driving cars are actually something we need? Or did we think something that people would be like, hey, self-driving car, it'd be cool to have, but. That, if you can get bonus points for him? That's the perfect question. The, because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something. You guys are probably too young to remember back in the, um, I'm going to say it's the 80s, the very first um, voice response systems. And so Chrysler, thank God it wasn't us. Um, Chrysler had this car, and when, when you open the door, it say, your door is ajar. No, it's not. It's a door. And stop saying that. It's really irritating. Um, we could do voice synthesis at that point in time. The technology existed, but it turned out it just pissed people off. Um, so, so you've got to be really careful. And what we found, we did a study on aging because the, the population is aging. Um, there are lots and lots of old people, and there are going to be more and more of them, and we're living longer because you know, medical technology is, is getting better. And, and at the beginning of that, we said, oh, autonomous vehicles will be perfect for aging baby boomers. Turns out baby boomers are the last people who want an autonomous car because they want to do it themselves. And if they need an autonomous car, it means they're getting old and they're not, they have a Peter, I'm one of them, um, we have a Peter Pan complex. We don't want to admit we're getting older. And so an autonomous car in that setting is not cool. Where autonomous starts to look interesting, if you look at, at the advent over the last couple of years with um, ride sharing with like Lyft and Uber, your generation is getting really good at, at doing what we said for years, which is don't drink and drive. So when you go out on the town, and that's, you know, we're partnered with Lyft now, and we know that 80% of their business is people who are out at night, who are having a good time on the town, and they know they're not supposed to drink and drive, so they don't. That's awesome. You guys are probably more predisposed to utilize an autonomous shuttle than I am. There's a social good. Do you need a driver in the car? And that's one of the things we're looking at is, you know, if you look at Lyft versus Uber, and Uber has got some interesting um, brand challenges with um, being perceived as kind of arrogant and cold, and Lyft is like the friendly, <coughs> fuzzy company. Um, if you take a driver out of the Lyft equation, did you just, like, did the brand, did you violate the brand? So, so, um, so there are a lot of people who potentially would benefit, I think, from autonomous driving. Older people who can no longer safely drive, like my dad. Um, so um, parents of pre-driving adolescents that, um, let's say, 12 to 15-year-old who's, you know, they can stay by themselves, like, you know, they're babysitting and stuff, and they need to get from dance to soccer. And mom and dad can't make it happen. There are a lot of parents who would be happy for an autonomous shuttle for the kids. So it's finding those use cases 
and really understanding the human needs in those use cases so that you apply the technology well. Now, do the sensors, actuators, and algorithms need to work flawlessly? Absolutely. That work needs to continue. Go ahead. So right, so the so the, the I'll call it the far distant future of a, a full level five autonomous where you don't have a, a driver in the vehicle ready to take over, um, and every vehicle on the road is like that. That's easy. It's between here and there that's challenging because how many times have you been walking down the hall and you're gonna and you do this right, and and you're both like fainting the same way. Um, so you can apply that to vehicles. So the algorithms are extremely complex. And, and how do you predict and what is the likelihood of any of those situations and is there, so you know, for the foreseeable future, there will be a steering wheel in your car and, and you're gonna be able to take over. Well, I guess what I was getting at is like, if you have a mixed self-driving car, it's hard to actually drive by yourself. Mm -hmm. You see like a huge, a lot of issues because it's still in right. the entire world with like self-driving cars being perfect. Yeah. Because there's a, there's so you, so you may see self-driving vehicles in initial application in closed campuses. So, so you can see, okay, you know, on, on the Purdue campus, if you need to get from here over to the ag campus, yes, there's an ag campus, who knew? Um, <laughs> you know, maybe there's a, a little, you know, instead of the bus system that we have today, are there little autonomous pods of some sort? So that's, so that's the societal piece that we have to look at. It's not just the technology, and I really appreciate the questions. Because you have to, yes, the technology has to work, but then you have to be able to zoom out and look at what are the policy issues, what are the societal issues in terms of, you know, do no harm, um, and what are people's needs. A and it's, it's, so it's very complex. You're right, and we don't have, I don't, no one has all the answers right now. Google's done a tremendous amount um, to further the, the, the algorithm understanding because of all the simulation that they're doing as well as the, road miles and, and it's actually really good to see someone who's a non-automotive doing that um, because sometimes in the automotive space because there are a lot of constraints when you're working in automotive unlike um, consumer <laughs> products or other you know consumer electronics we have to work for a hundred thousand miles we have to work at minus 40 we have to work at, at you know plus 120 we have to work in high vibration environments wet and dirty environments and cell phones don't, and computers don't, and, and a lot of electronics don't. So getting that pressure from the non-automotive world is really good for us, because the fact that it's hard doesn't mean we don't have to do it. And again, I think you have to keep the person, society, and the customers in the forefront and think about what, what you're doing for them. Is that? Okay, other questions? Because we don't have to go through the presentation at all, we can just talk, I'm easy. So how many of you in starting your Epix project um, came in at the very beginning of a project? Oh, quite a few. That's awesome. And, and so the rest of you came into something that was already kind of underway. Um, so what this talks about is that midterm part of a project where kind of at the beginning you're pretty good about going out and figuring out, okay, who's, who's my customer? What do they need? You gather all the data, and then like every good engineer, you dive into solving the problem, and you forget about the customer. <laughs> so this is to remind you that throughout the course of your problem solving, you really have to go back and check to see if you really are meeting the customer's needs. And we, we do this all the time. Um, we utilize a, a methodology that, um, is, you can call it design thinking, user-centered design, it's what IDEO does, it was, it's what a lot of major design firms do, is that you, you do, um, you understand the problem, you understand the people, you come up so, with some solutions, and you develop the minimum viable product, that whether it's a sketch, or origami, or a physical interaction, and you create a solution, and you take it back to the customer, and you let them play with it, and you listen to what they say, because you may or may not be on track. 
but you don't want to spend a ton of time and effort developing a perfect solution if it's wrong. So it's do the least amount of work so that you can get some feedback that will help you know if you're on target and then keep going. Um, sometimes you have to change, sometimes you don't. So while you worry about your customer, and this is not intuitive sometimes to engineers, is spending the time in the course of this work to really put the customer in the loop is going to really give you faster, truer decision-making and trade-offs in your design. And are you guys at a point, have you had to make trade-offs? Have you had to make decisions and you, you felt kind of iffy about it? Yeah. Do you want to give me an example? Um, well, like the, we're making a table that has a hearing aid in it. Okay. We really want it to be powered by a battery. Mm -hmm. It's not really feasible for us, so we're trying to like look into that and also convince them that an extension cord is not that bad. Okay. So we're trying to find a middle ground there. And in convincing them that an extension cord is not that bad, whose who's seat, whose head are you in? Yours or theirs? Well, from their perspective, I can see why they want a battery, but mm -hmm. also I feel like, I, I, see, I see what you're saying, but like a battery wouldn't, or a cord really wouldn't be as like interfering to mm -hmm. their lives like they think it would be. Okay. But we need to be able to show them that, and if they don't see that, then we need to look into the battery. So you could build two prototypes one yeah. of each and let them kind of go through an interaction with it and then get some real data. Because sometimes people do have um, unreasonable <laughs> or un just that, it's that irrational reaction um, yeah. you know, with in, in automotive, run flat tires. Um, run flat tires have existed for a long time and anybody have, a, have you ever had a flat tire in a car? It's not fun. It never happens when it's not raining. It never happens on a road that isn't busy. Um, so you're thinking, oh, as an engineer, oh, run flats, what a beautiful solution. And so you say to people, hey, we're going to give you run flat tires, and that way you don't need a spare tire. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want my spare tire, but you don't need one anymore. But I want my spare tire. It's a security blanket. And so you have to, you have to understand why do you want the spare tire? What are you going to do with it? Um, you can't tell them they don't want it. So you can't tell them they don't want the, the extension cord. Um, so yeah, so basically if you, if you don't continuously talk to your customer, you're really not going to know for sure if you're on, if you're on target. So, so it's kind of three steps. Um, plan what you need to find out from your customer. Think about what, do, what am I going to do and who's going to do it? If we've got a whole team, is everybody doing the same job? Are we taking on different roles? Show them. Show your customer your concepts. Don't just show them one thing because then they're not reacting, like they're reacting to one thing, not the range of solutions, which is where you get the real rich insights. And then ask them about, about what you're showing them. So what can you do to show your, show your concept? Um, it, it, everybody wants to build something, um, but sometimes you don't need to. Sketches do a great, a great job. We did a, um, we did a concept once where we were studying power, power door operation. And instead of spending the money to create a power and the time to design you know, a little electric actuator that's going to open the door, we just had a person open and close the door at different rates as people were walking up to the vehicle. And we said, OK, pretend it's raining. And how did that work? Well, that was too fast. That was too slow. We didn't build anything. We just created an experience. We, we had a virtual prototype that was just us um, doing body storming, if you will. Uh, videos are really effective. Um, everybody, I think, now is so good at creating videos that show um, possible futures that you can say, you know, this is how it's going to work and act it out. You can get a lot of rich feedback from that. Um, so do you guys use any of these methods in your projects? Yeah? Good. Any favorites? Things that you found that work really well? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I just, um, we had um, a concept for um, uh, a, a door, I'll just stay with the door example, um, that sensed the proximity of your key fob or cell phone. And as you walk up to the vehicle, it, um, the door that you approach, the latch electrically releases. 
so it's it's not powered it's not physically but it just it's off the latch so it kind of springs open a little bit and um, we did a video and there was somebody like laying across the front seat and they just you know opened the door you couldn't see them so it looked like the door magically opened and people because people had an idea of how you know how do car doors work um, they were very it was very easy for them to watch a video that showed this happening and you know it like had like little like uh, electrons coming out of their pocket to show a cell phone or a key fob um, they got it they understood how it worked we understood what their concerns were then about how, you know oh is it safe is it secure um, I'd be worried about this and then we could go develop a more robust system to their needs um, Autonomous, though, is an interesting one because people don't have a baseline for what an autonomous driving experience is. So if you create um, a video of an auto you know, we've all seen them, uh, videos of autonomous um, vehicles, you don't really know what it's like. You don't have a baseline, so it's harder to ask that. You have to think a little bit harder about how to give them a true experience um, from the, the prototypes that you're creating. Something like a, a, a nav system, you can do a sketch because people have, you know, between Waze and Google and Apple and, and, you know, and all the different nav systems that we operate on a daily basis, people have a really good familiarity so you can sketch a few things up and get some really good feedback. So, um, so, so here's the thing, when you're taking a, a concept out to get some feedback on it, you can't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't take just one thing, the one thing that you're working on. You have to have a benchmark. You know, here's, here's what you have today, and here's what I'm proposing, so that people have a basis of comparison. If you're only showing them one thing, you're not going to get the richest results. There may be things that um, are represented in the baseline that are missing in your concept, and you don't know it because you didn't ask it. It's best if you can develop a range, like two or three solutions, so that that car door is going to pop open based on my key fob, based on my phone, um, that I have a gesture that I wave at the door and it opens. And so they can, you give them a range of things to react to and let them talk about it, and it's going to give you better feedback. But it's also important to show the concepts equally. Don't, <laughs> don't build one beautiful, you know, beautiful table with the extension cord and, and everything, and then have like a matchstick example for your next one, and then a sketch for your next one. They're not, they're not equal. So they kind of be, have to be at the same level of um, fidelity to get good feedback. Um, yeah, and so show them the function, but then let them use it and document what, what they're doing with it. Don't, don't explain why they like it. <laughs> I've seen way too many people do that. So when you, so here's an equal concepts exercise. If this is your concept, which, which of these would be a better benchmark, <coughs> do you think, and, and why? Yeah. The one on the top right. Okay, and why is that? It's more like a car and not, it's like self-powered and not like a bicycle. Okay, okay, other thoughts? Okay, so you, and, and interestingly, I, you can argue you can argue this several ways. So, if you take this helmety thing and this one, well, they're both semi-enclosed. They're both powered. Um, they, you know, they're both three-wheeled. So there's a lot of you know a lot of commonalities. You, you, you could, somebody tried to make the argument that this is if this is what people are coming from. If this is the the market and this is their their daily experience, this may be the better concept. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it depends on what you want to learn, and, and 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 where you are in your process. Absolutely. Um, 
way too many builds in this. Okay. Um, so, so once you've represented something, now you have to ask about it too. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways you can ask. You can ask quantitatively with a questionnaire where everybody's you know, on a one to five scale. Do you like this a lot or a little? Um, you can do a focus group discussion where you have five or six people looking at the concept and evaluating it at the same time. I know in your, in your EPICS projects, that's not necessarily, sometimes there's a real singular customer, so that may not work. One of the challenges with focus groups is you tend to get one chatty person, <laughs> and, and then there's, or there's the, the, there's the introvert who would love to be there and would love to talk, but the extroverts are just <laughs> drowning them out. So you have to have a moderator who's willing to shut people up in, in a very nice way. Um, and to draw others into conversation. One-on-one -on -one interviews, um, I think, are extremely informative because then you can sit down with that person and, and really go in depth with, with understanding why they're saying something. Um, you can watch them. Um, we do things where we'll, um, we were doing a, a study on families, how they use their cars, and we rode around in the backseat of people's cars for a whole, for a weekend. Um, watching and going with them on errands and schlepping kids in and out of the car and, and um, equipment in and out of the back and groceries in and out of the back. And you'll learn a lot uh, because they, they kind of forget you're there and that you're not part of the family and you get everything so that the one-on-ones, depending on how much time you spend, can be really rich. Now, it's always good to know in asking what, what you need to learn. <laughs> um, and it's going to change through the course of your project. So when you're at a specific point in time and you're trying to make a trade-off, think what you really need to learn. Um, because if you don't know, you're going to just get mush. Um, as sometimes at the start of projects when we don't quite know where we're going yet, um, we, we might go out and do a field immersion in a specific topic. And it's kind of overwhelming, and so we tend to come back at the end of each day, like if we're studying megacities, urbanization. We've been out in, in you know, Sao Paulo all day, and everybody's just like, wow, it's really crowded. Um, that's not terribly helpful. Um, so you, you have to iterate a little bit, and you really depend on your team members and seeing what each person is observing to then figure out where you need to go, what you need to do next. Um, make sure you ask the target customer. This is one that, um, we see a lot in working with student competitions. Um, students will ask who's ever handy on campus, like your roommate, who may be a fabulous person, but if they're not the target customer, um, that's not great. We saw a team from, um, I think they were from Mexico, who were designing um, this little mobility scooter for um, the elderly, so for an aging population. And they tested it with people in their early 20s. <laughs> Not sure how much they learned that was relevant about um, a, you know, a 70 year old's interaction with this thing compared to a 20 year old. And it was real, it turned out it was really squirrely handling. And it was like, that will terrify people and break hips. Um, in person review is best. Um, let the customers make the choices. Use neutral names. If you have more than one concept, don't call one super cool, awesome thing and the other one B, C, and D. You, you kind of have to name them equally so that you're not biasing them. Um, and then listen ob and observe repeated three times. Um, having more than one set of eyes and ears, doing the listening and the observing is really helpful because everybody sees through their own filter and hears through their own filter of their expertise, their, their worldview. Um, so if one person on your team is doing the interview and ask, actually asking the questions, it's great to have a couple of at least two people watching and recording what's going on so that um, you can then go back after the fact with your notes, your stories, and your, your um, <coughs> video or audio recordings and, and consents on what you've seen. We had an example. We were out in um, San Francisco um, talking to people about luxury. And um, the, the person, this was a one-on-one -on -one interview where we went into people's homes and gave us a little home tour and then took us to their garage and talked to us about their car and the role of the car in their day. And one of the interview participants was absolutely convinced that the person we were, we were interviewing was a pathological liar and that everything they had said was false. 
never had this happen again. And so we had to really step back and say, wait, what are we 